Hi, my name is Scott Bradley. I'm joined with uh, joined. I'm joined by Joe Becker today, uh, and we're going to be talking about the, the acute headache emergency case uh, we saw earlier uh, in an earlier presentation. Uh, so, welcome. Thank you, Scott. So, the case uh, to review is a 23-year-old man uh, presenting to the emergency department uh, with progressive severe headache over the last two days. His headache uh, was described as the worst headache of his life. It was associated with fatigue, photophobia. Some chills, body aches, but he notes uh, he has no stiff neck. Uh, pain is uh, mostly right side and the right side of his uh, head, starts behind the eye, and radiates throughout the head and neck. Of note, he is previously healthy. He's a student and has no past medical history. So let's go uh, through the clip again and, uh, and watch uh, the presentation as was made by the medical student. I have a 23-year-old law student with two days of right periorbital throbbing headache associated with nausea and photophobia. No fever, no stiff neck, no history of migraines, but this one seems classic. I'm thinking a six of Imitrex, sub Q. Yep, sounds good. All right, so we have a 23-year-old male presenting with the symptoms as above. Uh, medical student's going to be treating him for some uh, headache mig uh, with migraine treatment medications. So, uh, Dr. Becker, uh, what part of this headache history uh, do you find uh, to be concerning, or are there any parts that you find are dangerous? All right. Well, you know, Scott, we see a lot of patients with headache in the emergency room. It's a very common presenting complaint, and we try to classify those patients based on their history and physical into dangerous or not. And one of the things that immediately jumps out at me from this presentation is that it seems like this is a patient who does not have a history of headaches. Uh, this is a new headache for him, uh, which seems to be unusual. Um, furthermore, you know, I think most people at some point in their lives get a headache for whatever reason, and this headache seems to be particularly bad for this guy. He seems to be a very, very severe headache, um, and that those are, of course, you know, the first and worst uh, being two characteristics that I think are very important to consider when you're trying to determine if a patient with a headache syndrome is in danger or if they're just having a run-of-the-mill headache. Drew, uh, also they note uh, some photophobia, some sure, vision changes, sure. any concerns about that at all? Yeah, I mean, so certainly we heard about the patient having nausea and vomiting and, and photophobia. Um, and these, uh, these can be, of course, signs of dangerous things going on in the head. Uh, certainly increases in um, intracranial pressure can result in nausea and vomiting. And then photophobia can be, uh, or is thought to be, potentially a result of irritation of the meninges. Um, so these could potentially be concerning. Now, as well, many people who have migraines will tell you that nausea and vomiting and photophobia are just part and parcel of their typical migraine syndrome. And certainly, as the medical student noted, this can be classical, as she said. And so these symptoms can be a little bit harder to kind of parse out if they're truly dangerous or not. But um, certainly, they are not benign symptoms that would suggest a benign headache complex. Sure, it's one of the difficult parts of, uh, of trying to determine whether a headache is uh, dangerous or not. Some of the benign headaches or primary headaches, migraines and uh, cluster headaches and tension headaches, they can have nausea, vomit, photophobia, vision course, changes. Sure, all that there's a lot of overlap in the symptom right. complexes. But the main thing, that, and I agree, uh, the first and the worst uh, in someone without any history of headaches is something that uh, needs to be taken, a second of look course. needs to be taken. Of course. All right, well, let's see uh, what happens. Oh, what, before we move on, one more question. Uh, Again, the medical student says sub-Q imitrex. Right. Again, presenting to the attending, doctor hasn't seen Are you okay with that kind of initial sure, treatment? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, uh, in emergency medicine, you know, we frequently talk about how our job is to consider the worst case scenario before we immediately jump to the sometimes more likely and more reasonable diagnoses that are not dangerous. You know, so in this sure. case, the medical student seems to be jumping straight to migraine, which is certainly not usually a dangerous diagnosis. And, you know, based on the symptom complex, she may be right uh, frequently. However, it doesn't sound like much consideration was given to the dangerous things that we all need to consider when we're seeing a patient particularly a patient with a first and worst headache. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a problem with the supervising doctor really not evaluating the patient, not seeing the patient, and making this decision to go ahead with migraine treatment without much firsthand knowledge. And then, of course, there's also the problem of assuming that this patient just has a straightforward, uh, you know, migraine headache without really much discussion or considerations about 
the other possibilities which could be severe. Sure. Yeah. And she might be right. 99 times sure, out of 100, this is true. But if yeah. she's wrong. Could Migraine be wrong. headache is common. And, sure. and, you know, sometimes that is, of course, the appropriate first treatment. Um, but that's oftentimes the case in the patient who has a history of migraine, who yeah. will tell you, I have migraine and I'm here with my migraine headache. Right. Um, and so in this case, uh, while this may be an effective and option, a treatment option, it certainly is important to consider dangerous things sure. as well. Okay. Well, let's see what happens. What's going on? I was just coming to get you. What's his name? Paul yeah. Sobricki. How are you feeling, Paul? My wife doesn't like the diner either, and I... I uh-huh. He's sort of babbling. Yeah, he's puking. He's altered. Why didn't you come and get me? I was on my way. I'll be there. You can meet me there. So, uh, obviously, that didn't seem like a sort of a standard migraine. Right, uh, right. Maybe the patient evolved some new symptoms while they were waiting to be seen, perhaps... It's a waxing and waning level of symptom uh, symptom severity, but uh, that patient appeared to be altered. Sure, uh, there sure. was vomit on his shirt, uh, right. uh, not really responding to the questions as appropriately. Um, and then when you look at the vital signs, uh, which we'll pull up right here, um, you notice that while the patient denied having a fever, um, it does appear that uh, he does have at least a uh, low grade, low grade yeah. temperature, and he also has some abnormal vital signs with an elevated heart rate and respiratory rate as well. So, uh, what part of this patient's physical exam uh, is concerning for a dangerous source of uh, headache or a headache emergency? Sure. So, well, you know, so that does seem like this patient's condition has worsened since the initial presentation. Um, you, what you'd want, certainly the patient's mental status is an immediate red flag. I mean, migraine headaches are not typically associated with the kind of florid confusion that you saw on the part of that patient. Um, we did hear that he had nausea and vomiting, and so that, like as we discussed earlier, is uh, confirmed by the you know, presence of the, uh, the vomit that's there in the in the film, but um, so certainly the patient's confusion will be important. Mm -hmm. It'll be very important as well now to perform a you know very detailed neurologic examination, and part of that will be an evaluation of the patient's meninges. So certainly, um, you know, assessing for uh, nuchal rigidity <clears throat> or meningismus with the Koenig's or Brzezinski signs are going to be important, and then as well searching for focality on the neurologic examination by performing you know, sensory. Uh, motor exam, if at all possible, with this patient, as well as cranial nerves, uh, et cetera. These will be very important things to kind of develop a sense for, you know, what is going on with this patient. Sure. Yeah, yeah. with the ultramental status and a sort of a temperature, we start sure, going sure. towards the maybe infectious kind of, of line of uh, etiologies or maybe something else that would uh, alter the, the body's ability to regulate itself. Sure. So, yeah, the uh, vital sign abnormalities. Um, normal. So, definitely requires uh, further evaluation. Um, in addition to the, the signs that he's presented here, um, in a young person, is there any other sort of signs or symptoms that you look for? You, you, just, you mentioned uh, pretty much all of the neurologic findings, looking for focal neurologic findings. Anything else on exam, maybe a skin, heart, sure, lungs, sure. anything like that? Sure. Well, you know, altered mental status, of course, can be, a, uh, along with fever, can, of course, can be a component of neurologic infections, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But certainly, it's also important to consider infectious conditions in general. You know, infections that are remote to the central nervous system can still cause altered mental status. In fact, patients who are in septic shock often come in sure. with uh, confusion or altered mental status. Right, delirium. <clears throat> delirium associated with an infectious process, of course. So it'll be important to perform a you know, targeted, but at the same time comprehensive physical examination to make sure that you're not missing a remote site of infection, which could be responsible for the patient's uh, declining condition. Right. And some of those red flag rashes we can look for that could be a sign of sort of infectious etiology, sure. uh, a non-blanching or petechial of rash, course. that kind of stuff. But yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, move on here and see uh, how things progress. Don't tell them. I don't. This could be encephalitis or meningitis. Them. Damn it, Lucy! You should have told me this when you presented him. He seemed fine, and I was coming to get you. All right, Malik, no. give him to a vat of anti-IV push. Lucy, no, check his electrolytes, no calcium, thyroid panel, and tox screen. I'm going to go get an LP kit. All right. So we now have this patient that's altered, headache, abnormal vital signs. What would you do as an initial uh, treatment stabilization evaluation for this person? What's your first kind of steps? And sure. uh, this doctor gave him Ativan. <clears throat> Uh, didn't really kind of talk about the the steps leading up to that, but what would you kind of what would you want to do with this person? Well, you know, as we've always kind of said in the approach to the emergency patient, you know, 
any change in the condition should prompt the reassessment and then you, for you to start over with the evaluation of the ABCs and the, basically the patient's condition, set of vital signs, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we see in this case the patient's airway seems to be uh, patent. Mm -hmm. um, he's certainly communicating. Uh, he seems to be breathing well as evidenced by his adequate oxygen saturation. And in fact, he's a little bit tachypneic and uh, he's got a blood pressure. Um, so these uh, ABCs being assessed, I think, is, uh, is an important first step in kind of reassessing the patient's vital signs as um, as we uh, as we discussed, um, and then you know you mentioned the Ativan, the benzodiazepine that was given to this patient uh, in this condition. Um, I, I mean, I think it, it certainly is sometimes necessary to provide these kinds of medications to patients who are. Um, uh, an altered mental status or confusion. Uh, it'd be a little difficult sometimes because you, if a patient became sedated from that medication, you'd be unclear if that was your medication mm -hmm. taking effect or progression and worsening of what could be a serious medical condition. You here. may lose some aspects of your exam. It's true. You, the patient already has a very difficult time communicating with you effectively, and now you may potentially even further cloud that. Um, so while sometimes necessary, you know, less is more frequently as well, and it may be as important to withhold these medications unless they're really actually necessary. Sure. Um, but putting them up on the monitor, certain IV access, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. That, exactly. Putting right. them, giving them, providing oxygen if right. necessary, getting them on a cardiac monitor, and obtaining an IV access are going to be important considerations of uh, this patient's care. Right. Care. And basically, most of these altered, um, if we hadn't done already, probably a glucose would have been a good of uh, point of care of for glucose. Uh, just because hypoglycemia can, can often alter, sure. uh, alter someone, sure. especially a dramatic decline, uh, uh, something to, to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, if you have this patient, the uh, uh, doctor kind of rattled off a lot of orders there. Uh, um, do you have a differential for an otherwise healthy young person presenting with headache? Uh, and now, I guess, with altered mental status. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, what do, what do we know? So this patient has uh, the major components of this patient's story are young, otherwise healthy man with uh, headache, uh, now altered mental status, vomiting, and fever. Mm -hmm. And so based on that, you'd want to consider a host of etiologies and kind of classify them into categories. And the first would be infectious. And so you'd have to consider central nervous system infections, such as encephalitis or meningitis, mm -hmm. as uh, as the character in the clip mentioned. Absolutely. Um, and other central nervous system infections, such as abscesses or, um, <clears throat> or um, potentially uh, viral or fungal etiologies. Sure. As well, as we, as we discussed briefly, other infectious processes sure. not in the central nervous system can also result in delirium. And these, of right. course, would have to be considered as well. Right. Things like pneumonia, yeah. urinary tract infections, skin and soft tissue infections. Yeah. Um, so the patient's temperature certainly suggests that this has an infectious or inflammatory source, but as the uh, character in the clip mentioned as well, checking things like a toxicology panel mm -hmm. would be important too because this is, can be uh, part of the history that is frequently not provided by a patient or their family member when they come in. Um, and furthermore, other metabolic causes mm -hmm. of confusion such as the glucose, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. or um, the calcium or the thyroid test, as was uh, ordered by the character in the clip here, I think are, are also important considerations. Um, and then you'd have to consider inflammatory issues as well, such as um, particularly uh, inflammatory conditions affecting different parts of the central nervous system, such as uh, potentially multiple sclerosis or something sure. like that. So uh, the differential diagnosis largely would be lumped into infectious and non-infectious etiologies, and you have to kind of tailor your diagnostic strategy accordingly to kind of address the... Uh, the line items you identify in your differential. Well, excellent. Um, we've uh, hit both uh, most of those. Uh, I think that is a very comprehensive uh, evaluation. History is somewhat limited by the patient's altered mental status, so we can't find sort of some of those red flags in the history. So we have to kind of do a broad uh, differential. Um, uh, the doctor did uh, went for um, electrolytes, looking for calcium metabolic sure, abnormalities. Sure. Um, uh, tox screen, as you said, a thyroid test looking for thyroid toxicosis or derangements of the uh, thyroid system, um, and uh, is going to go for an LP kit, course, which right. I think is all appropriate. Sure. Any other uh, treatments? So you didn't mention maybe more of a broad infection, maybe, maybe x-rays and stuff. Any other uh, scans or tests right, you might right. do? Well, I mean, it really kind of depends on the patient we have in front of us, but certainly our, the diagnostic net that we're going to cast here can be very broad. Um, so this patient's presenting with a headache and a potential infectious etiology. So, you know, certainly an initial 
discussion or consideration of his immunologic status will be important. And that's important for pretty much anyone with an infectious uh, syndrome coming to you. Does this patient have evidence of immune suppression? Is mm -hmm. this patient HIV positive or have a history of HIV risk factors? Is this patient taking steroids? Does this patient have a history of chemotherapy dosing? I mean, these are important things to consider as they will have a dramatic impact on how wide our differential diagnosis is. Um, and as such, uh, sometimes it is important to consider central nervous system imaging, like a CAT scan of the brain, mm -hmm. um, particularly prior to the performance of a lumbar puncture. Now, people always wonder if in patients who are getting a lumbar puncture, there's the risk of increased intracranial pressure and thus potentially bad outcomes when you perform a lumbar puncture. Um, so certainly, I think in many cases, a CT of the brain is indicated uh, in patients with altered mental status, particularly if there's a question of a traumatic injury or perhaps even a brain mass. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if the patient has any history uh, or suggestion of immune compromise, I think a CT scan of the brain is very indicated because certainly patients we know who have uh, HIV and AIDS are at higher risk for development of intracranial masses, such as toxoplasmosis, <clears throat> as well as um, CNS lymphoma and even abscesses, and these, of course, can raise intracranial pressure and thus cause um, uh, these particular changes in, in mental right. status in the presentation we see. It can also be, in the absence of the availability of a CAT scan, uh, some assessment of intracranial pressure should be made, and that can be clinical. So as we discussed before, this patient seems to have nausea, vomiting, and photophobia, and these have kind of been associated possibly with uh, symptoms that possibly could indicate increased intracranial pressure. And as well, if possible, uh, an assessment of the uh, ophthalmologic assessment of the fundi mm -hmm. to determine if the patient has evidence of uh, increased uh, intracranial pressure would also be uh, appropriate if a CAT scan was not obtainable. All right. So the, the risk for having a lumbar puncture prior to knowing the patient's uh, intracranial pre uh, pressure uh, is that you could cause more harm than good by doing your it's assessment. True. You could cause <clears throat> uh, disequilibrium and you could actually cause some brain damage. Or that's sure. the concern. If there is increased intracranial right. pressure, yeah. And this is a, you know, this is a controversial point, but mm -hmm. I think um, particularly in settings where this really may be a real concern, you know, where somebody may really have a central nervous system mass, like sure, lymphoma absolutely. or an abscess or toxoplasmosis uh, 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 in their brain. I think this is something important to okay. consider. All right, so CT scan uh, prior to lumbar puncture, if possible. Uh, uh, if you're unable to get a CT scan, uh, do a thorough exam looking for signs of intracranial pressure. Exactly. Um, and if it's gonna be a long time and delay, also maybe a good time to do a clinical exam uh, to see if you can't do it. Because if it is some sort of central nervous system infection, we would like to treat that early course, and aggressively. Of course, of course. Okay. Well, we'll go on to the lumbar puncture. Uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing in another lecture how to perform a lumbar puncture. There's a lot of good resources, but let's see what we got. Ativan, put them right out. Okay, draw the lidocaine. One and four for cell count, protein and glucose in two, and gram stain and culture in three. You got it. All right, the uh, lumbar puncture was performed and uh, we get the results back rather quickly at this point. Um, uh, the uh, fluid was noted to be cloudy. The cell count is quite elevated. Uh, normal range is uh, zero to five, it's, uh, it's over a thousand. Uh, you have uh, elevated uh, protein at 300. You have low glucose, the range actually ranges from about 45 to about 85, uh, closer to the normal blood glucose level. And actually they performed the gram stain and. Uh, they did find a few gram-positive cocci uh, in pairs. And we'll go over sort of a cerebrospinal fluid analysis right now, um, something that uh, will just have to be memorized, but because of all the bacteria uh, suspe suspe uh, we suspect are in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, we have elevated protein, uh, low glucose, because the bacteria is thought to consume glucose sure. in, the, sure. in the cerebrospinal fluid, and then the white blood cells uh, are... Uh, quite elevated, including, uh, indicating an active uh, uh, sure. uh, immunologic response. So what's the next steps? It uh, looks like you've diagnosed some sort of bacterial meningitis with gram-positive uh, mm -hmm. cocci mm -hmm. in pairs. Right, so <clears throat> treatment for this will be very, very important, obviously, and so we'd want to get this patient appropriate treatment very, very quickly. Um, and in this setting, it sounds like our gram stain is positive, and we actually see bacteria in this uh, in this particular clip, and so are in this particular results. And so I think at this point, uh, antibacterial 
um, medications will be very important. So um, this will be guided largely by your kind of local ecology and as well resistance patterns. But certainly you'd want to cover for some major uh, organisms such as streptococci mm -hmm. as well as Neisseria meningitidis. And in, in, in many settings this involves two grams in adults of ceftriaxone, uh, or rocephin as the trade name is. Um, and this will be important to get on board as quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> other places, it may be important to consider uh, vancomycin uh, for uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, if that's a consideration in your area, and as well in some elderly patients, uh, other uh, particular bacterial pathogens can be a consideration. But broad coverage for bacterial uh, organisms is very important in this setting. Now, we also um, saw that this patient has a positive gram stain. Mm -hmm. um, but it may be important to have considered starting therapy very early in this patient's care. You saw that the lumbar puncture was performed and the results came back very quickly here. But he, you know, in many settings, that's not always the case. It takes time to perform the LP. Perhaps the patient's combative, they need to be sedated. Um, it also may take a long time to get the results back. You know, some laboratories are not very efficient and these are tests that take some time. And certainly if you're considering an incredibly dangerous diagnosis such as meningitis, which can result in either death or severe central nervous system disability, you'd want this patient to be treated earlier rather than later. Um, and so treating up front with um, antibiotics early in the patient's course, I think, will be uh, very important. This does not typically alleviate or prevent performing an LP to determine if the patient has any um, you determine the patient has evidence of meningitis, but you can still get the antibiotics on board early. Right. Treat um, early with empiric antibiotics. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and depending on the patient's clinical condition and the situation, such as his immunologic status, this may include empiric treatment with non uh, or other uh, agents that are not covering strictly bacteria. So mm. perhaps antiviral etiologies, okay. such as acyclovir uh, for HSV encephalitis, it might be important if the patient had HIV in a low CD4 count, covering them for cryptococcal meningitis with sure. the amphotericin, uh, perhaps fluconazole will be important as well. Um, so that's an important considerations in the patient you have in front of you. If you determine that they may have risk for these diseases, it'll be important to kind of include that therapy empirically, even though you don't initially have the benefit of direct uh, diagnosis of that. You know, something else, Scott, that I think needs to be discussed is the dosing of steroids. Sure. Uh, so, you know, steroids have been shown to uh, have a very beneficial effect in patients with bacterial meningitis, um, and frequently we do provide steroids to patients with this diagnosis. Um, as you might imagine, though, this can be a little bit of a difficult uh, consideration in patients who we don't really know what's going on. So those patients with impaired immune systems who have the real potential of having tuberculosis, meningitis, sure. or perhaps other, uh, you know, very severe central nervous system infections, we're not 100% sure what the effect of dosing steroids are in those, uh, in those settings. So I think... Um, <clears throat> Many times, if a patient did have uh, you know, tuberculous meningitis, steroids would be a very important part of the treatment plan. Um, but it, it can be very difficult to know early on what the patient's actual etiology of their infection is, and thus uh, providing patients with steroids is something to really consider and think about. Yeah, uh, the, uh, in sort of the Western countries, uh, it is uh, considered a standard of care by some infectious disease, uh, infectious disease societies to, to pretreat with uh, dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's assuming that uh, that's going to be bacterial and sure. strep pneumonia sure. or haemophilus influenza, which is another, right. another uh, etiology. Right. Um, and really, other, other etiologies hasn't been shown to benefit too much, and it's very highly dependent on the etiology. Sure, so sure. something certainly to consider um, based on your local practice patterns, your local uh, ecology of infections. Um, but uh, I think this patient uh, uh, certainly would benefit from two grams of recephin, gram of vancomycin. Up front, right. Up front right. uh, probably steroids beforehand given right. that he's in the United States. Right. Um, and then kind of trying to delve in, getting family... Sure. Uh, uh, other history to find, sure. find out sure. if he needs uh, antivirals, uh, antifungals, or other sort of other aggressive sure. treatments. Sure. I mean, it should be mentioned that you know these patients, uh, you know, part of his initial raft of laboratory testing should have been an HIV test. As sure, well, HIV as test. part of this, and then um, 
that I think if it can, you know, most rapid tests can be performed in 10 minutes. Sure. And so this, uh, I think, uh, would at least provide us with some guidance early on in terms of tailoring his therapy. And we also have the benefit of actually seeing bacteria on the gram yeah. stain, you know, kind of unusual, which not... is a lucky, right. uh, you, you know, fortuitous, yeah, fortuitous uh, development. And so that can help us uh, in terms of uh, treating early. So where does this patient go? We've done our, we're evaluating, acting, reevaluating, thinking. We've got a diagnosis of what appears to be uh, bacterial meningitis with uh, gram positive cocci, which is the strep pneumo, uh, streptococcus uh, pneumoniae bacteria. So what? So what does this? What is? What do we do with this gentleman after we give him his antibiotics? Sure. I mean, this patient certainly is going to require admission to the hospital. Um, it may even require a very, um, a very highly monitored setting, such as an intensive care unit, if one is available to you. Um, in the patient's current condition, we'd want to be uh, vigilant for de further decline. Already, the patient seems to have worsened uh, sure. since presentation. And so we'd want to be vigilant and prepared to intervene if we needed to, to support his hemodynamics, his blood right. pressure, as well his airway. If his mental status continues to decline, he's already vomiting, you know, these can be a bad combination in terms of someone's airway being, uh, being lost uh, or obstructed. And so we really want the patient to be in a setting where they're closely monitored so intervention for these, um, you know, developments would be easy to undertake if, if, if necessary. And sometimes that would require an intensive care unit and perhaps even transfer to a level of higher care if your facility could not support a patient with this uh, potentially dangerous diagnosis. Um, and, you know, it also will be important to mention, Scott, that, you know, a patient with this uh, diagnosis will likely require isolation. Um, you know, in patients who uh, potentially have meningitis or, or a Neisseria meningitis, um, this is a very transmissible uh, disease, and, and healthcare workers can be um, at risk for uh, contracting this. At this point, we're not, you know, the, with the gram stain, we have a kind of a sense that this could be streptococcal, but, uh, you know, until kind of a culture confirmed that this patient did not have Neisseria, uh, it would be very important to isolate this patient from other patients as well, and as well uh, have providers and caregivers take the appropriate uh, barrier precautions uh, while they are caring for this patient. And indeed, it may be necessary for some of the healthcare providers that have been treating this patient thus far to receive prophylactic treatment with antibiotics given that the given their contact with him uh, prior to the knowledge of what this actual agent is that's causing his meningitis. All right, we'll get him admitted. Uh, one just final question. Uh, you notice that that gentleman never had this classic stiff neck and didn't right. report the fever. Um, what, what, do you, what do you feel like? Uh, is that something that you've had experience with? Or does everyone with meningitis always have to have a stiff neck? Is it always support? Right. Uh, is this, what right. would you say about that? Well, you know, right you are, Scott. Uh, it can definitely happen that patients either do not tell you the full story or they did not experience the textbook presentation mm -hmm. of a particular clinical condition. So this patient had a low-grade temperature. Uh, certainly, perhaps they did not experience that or know that. And then, of course, they became confused and were really unable to tell you what they did right. feel. And Limited so, history, yeah. yeah, so certainly that's it, that the, the history is oftentimes incomplete or erroneous. And so while the history is important to obtain, we have to always consider that it may not be the full story. And then furthermore, while this gentleman still appears to be relatively healthy, it does need to be said that patients with significantly impaired immune systems may not manifest the typical inflammatory changes that we expect to see. Right. And that can be inclusive of the elderly as well. You know, we may not see a fever. Or very young. Uh, or very young, yeah. exactly. We may not see a fever. We may not see the typical meningeal inflammation that results in, you know, our classical Kernigs and Brzezinski's uh, signs. So, so certainly while the presence of those signs definitely um, helps us to narrow our clinical decision-making, uh, their absence does not necessarily indicate that we can exclude sure. consideration of sure. meningitis. So when other. we see those big red flags of headache and ultra status and abnormal vital signs, even if they don't all line up in a row, you still have to evaluate, uh, assume that one of those dangerous Certainly. headache emergencies could still be a part of the presentation. Certainly. Certainly. And the first or worst headache, you have first to, or worst have to keep these things on the table until you're able to mm, satisfy yourself that these are not uh, parts uh, or not considerations in the differential diagnosis. Well, excellent. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it.